that's also part of the note well i think blue sheets please fill in the blue sheets on the etherpad on the very end uh the etherpad url has been sent around this is part of the agenda uh, please fill in this is the agenda for today we're currently the agenda bashing in the blue sheets uh, we have two current business presentations the young types and the dns cookies from uh, from uh, ladislav and willem uh, respectively respectively and we have three new business working group new business the DNS timeout uh, pre uh, draft it has been presented earlier uh, we have a second uh, presentation now it was already scheduled at uh, the singapore working group but it was bumped because we had more time for discussion we needed more time for discussions uh, there's also a, a, a chair action to, uh, with a question adopt or not we'll ask the working group today but also on the mailing list of course and there are two new uh, drafts not presented earlier by uh, schumann and uh, dimitri later this afternoon um okay any comments on the agenda? No? Okay, thank you. So then I want to go to the first uh, presenter, Ladislav. I will show the slides, Ladislav, and you can say next, next, and we go to the next slide. Give me one moment. Hi, can you hear me, by the way? Yes, excellent, thanks. Yeah. Okay, great. Let's see how this works if it goes well. Okay. Sharing, open, okay. There we go. There we go. Do you see all the slides? Do all of you see the slides? Yes. Yep. Thank you. Okay, let's please go ahead. My audio is now somehow broken. I don't know if, can you still hear me properly? Yes, I do hear you uh, quite loud and, uh, loud and clear. Okay. So, so I am Vladislav Hutka and Petr Špaček is the other co-author of this draft. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this is just a recap what this draft is about. We basically took two INR registries that are important for, for DNS, namely DNS classes and uh, resource record types. And uh, this draft attempts to translate uh, these uh, registries into Yang data types. It means into a form that's uh, suitable for suitable to be used uh, in in the yang data modeling uh, language uh, this document only provides an initial revision of the yang module the idea is that after this document is published yana iana will uh, publish the yang module on on their pages and then keep maintaining the module independently of this RFC. So this RFC is really for the initial revision of the Yang module. Next slide, please. There have been two uh, bigger changes to the draft since uh, the previous individual uh, revision. The most important one is that now instead of uh, having really the initial revision of the yang module itself the draft now contains an xslt style sheet that can be used by iana for producing for generating the initial revision i'm going to explain it in a moment and then the other uh, change was that uh, the two statuses used by iana namely obsolete and deprecated are now met to a single Yang st status, namely obsolete. I will also talk about that in, in a minute. Next slide, please. 
So if you look uh, uh, at Appendix A of, of the draft, you can find an XSLT style sheet there. And this style sheet can be extracted from the document easily using the well-known tools and then using two other ubiquitous tools, namely curl and XSLT proc. Uh, this is just the command line that can be used for, for generating the complete text of the initial revision of the Yang module. So this change should solve the concerns that were expressed previously about the fact that the, the, uh, R, the future RFC would stay unchanged, even though the module itself would uh, develop and would be maintained and updated by IANA. So the concern was that somebody may come later and use that module from the, this RFC, including some, some uh, deprecated, possibly dangerous uh, items from the IANA registries, which is, of course, not, uh, not uh, welcome and not intended. So uh, this this way we can see this. I now will generate the module at the moment from the status of the registries that will be current at that particular moment. And in fact, if anybody happens to use this style sheet again later, he or she can also generate the car the then current status of of the registries. The only difference from the official Yang module will be that uh, the history of revisions won't be, won't be included. That's because the revision history is not kept in uh, the INA re registries themselves. So it's simply impossible for the style sheet to include it. Last week, I also asked, asked Ayana about their position towards this style sheet, whether this procedure is, is uh, applicable for them. I haven't received any response uh, yet, so hopefully it will be acceptable for them. Because, uh, as you can see, it, it's really quite easy to generate the module. Next slide, please. This is about uh, the semantics of obsolete and deprecated. Unfortunately, there is this discrepancy in, in the meaning as it is used by IANA and in Yang. For IANA, obsolete means that it's just a statement of the fact that something is no longer in use, whereas deprecated, is, uh, deprecated means that some item is not recommended for use. It may be a, a weak encryption algorithm or something like this. Whereas in Yang, obsolete really means some strong no or relatively strong no, whereas deprecated is quite liberal. As you can see, it's an obsolete defi definition, but it permits uh, new uh, implementations in order to foster interoperability. So of course, this is not, not something that we would like to see. And for the time being, we decided to map um, both IANA terms to the obsolete term, which is like a strong no in, in, in Yang. Because this uh, discrepancy could be fixed, in, but it can be done only in the next revision of, of Yang, the language. And basically, this meaning of obsolete and deprecated comes, uh, it's a legacy from, from the times of SNMP and SMI. But I have already raised this issue in the Netmod Working Group. Hopefully, it can be done uh, in the next version of the Young language, but it's not going to happen anytime soon. So I think this fix for the time being is, is quite satisfactory, and hopefully, we can use it. Uh, immediately. Next slide, please. These are the proposed next steps. We received a few uh, recommendations, a few suggestions for improving the text. So we will implement these 
uh, in a zero zero one revision of this draft that should appear soon after this meeting. And the authors uh, now believe that the document is ready for working group last call. And in this case, it should also uh, include uh, a review by one of the young doctors, uh, except myself, hopefully. So somebody else will look at, at this from the young point of view and find some problems if there are any. But other than that, I believe that there is not much to do on, on this document and that we can really um, move it move it forward in, in the DNSOP working group. So that's all I have in my presentation. Thank you. If you have any questions, I am ready to answer. Thank you. Um, so for everyone, uh, for everyone, if you have a question, uh, plus Q in the chat window in WebEx, please state your name and your affiliation. So far, I don't see questions. Joe, uh, okay. Joe Emily. Yeah. So one moment, let us talk. Uh, Joe, please go ahead. Hi there. Can you hear me okay? Um, so I'm, I'm possibly just a bit out of touch, and I apologize if so, but it's, your slides suggest that um, the IANA is not already in the practice of producing Yang modules from registries, and this would be new for them. It does seem like that is an important part of defining these modules in this document, because I think a lot of people have had concerns that the document otherwise will be out of date as soon as, for example, somebody else specifies a new RR type. So, am I am I are we correct that this is kind of hinging on the response from the IANA and their ability to, to keep the module up to date with the registry? Well, just let me explain. IANA already has a few modules like this that are based on other uh, IANA registries. For example, interface type interface types was the registry to be translated in this form. But so far, IANA was used to receiving the initial revision in in a form of an RFC, and then man, man, maintain this module using their procedures. I am not sure what these procedures are actually, but because of the objections in the DNS of working group, we had quite a few discussions with the chairs and with Paul Walters, who was the, the most vocal person to object and so in the end we found the solution instead of publishing a fixed uh, fixed text of this initial module that we can use these like templates in in the XSLT form so that IANA can and should be able to easily produce this initial version themselves. So the only thing that's not clear is whether this new method of producing the initial revision is acceptable for IANA. I hope that it should be because it's uh, no rocket science to, to run those two easy commands. And IANA already replied to my to my question. They said they will look into it and uh, try to use my instructions to see if it's, if it's doable for them. So I hope it, it will be done for them. Other than that, they are quite, I would say, quite you. There is a page uh, under IANA that uh, lists quite a few of these modules that are based on the registry. So I, I hope there will be uh, no uh, real issue with this new method. But I haven't received a response yet. OK, that's, that's very clear. Thanks. I see Michelle's in the queue, so perhaps you're about to get a response. Uh, Michelle, Michelle Cotton. Hi, Michelle Cotton um, from IANA. Um, so I don't, um, Ladislav did send us some information on producing um, a Yang module, and we have been um, testing it out, and um, I, I think that it's going to be okay. Um, I guess I, I haven't seen this document yet. Um, is this not, um, is this in the tracker yet? It should be there. I think it's there. I'm 
might have been looking up the wrong um, draft string. Um, so I think it, it'd be great to do an early review of this document to make sure that if we do have questions early, um, we can get them straightened out and answered way ahead of time of um, IETF last call. Um, that would be um, extremely helpful. Thank you, Joe. Um, I was looking at the wrong draft string, so that that explains that. Um, so I'll, we'll go ahead and uh, take the action now to, to look at this um, as an early review and provide some feedback back looking at the the entire document and what's going to be asked of us. So we'll go ahead and, and take that action. Okay, so I can send you the pointer or the chairs can do it as well. I noticed that the data tracker has gone mad a bit in the last few days. So let me check. I hope it's still there, the draft. Yeah, no, it, it, is, it is. I was looking at the wrong, at the wrong draft string. So um, we're good. We're going to take a look at that and, and we'll send back feedback and any questions we have. Very much, uh, Michelle. Um, it's very positive news. So, any other comments, questions? No. Okay. Then I want to thank you, uh, Ladislav. Okay. Thank you. Okay, next up is uh, Willem. Willem Torop with the uh, Dina Surf cookies. I will. Yes. Yes. One moment. Uh... Okay. Are your slides up now? I'm sorry? Are, are your slides up now? Yeah. I see. Those are my slides. I, do, I don't have the same perspective as you have, I think, from the. So it's, okay. it's, for me, it's as if I look at, at my own desktop. But uh, great. Okay. So this draft is an update on RFC 7873, the document describing the cookies. It's addressing an issue which operators experience with Anycast server sets using authoritative name server software from different different vendors. Next slide. First, I explain quickly what the purpose is of DNS cookies and the issue this draft addresses. So, why DNS cookies? UDP services that reply with a bigger response than the request that came in, like DNS, are susceptible to amplification, denial of server attacks. This is the kind of attack in which an attacker spoofs the victim IP address, possibly from a botnet, to flood small requests that results in large answers which are sent to the victim's IP address and as a result clock the victim's connection. So DNS cookies are a DNS native mitigation against these kinds of attacks. Now that protocols on top of TCP do not have this issue, thanks to the TCP handshake. Next slide. And this is precisely how DNS cookies achieves its purpose too. It introduces a handshake. So how does that work? A client creates a client cookie, which is basically a nonce, and sends it alongside the DNS request in an eDNS option. The server creates a server cookie based on the client cookie, client IP address, and the secret, and then returns that with the uh, DNS response packet. And when the client needs to query that server again, it sends the server cookie it learned for that server with the query. The server can recognize its own cookie and change response policies accordingly. Did the client present a valid server cookie? Large answers are allowed, and the client will not be subject to response by LinkedIn. I don't know who, who made this sound, but that was not uh, at my place. Next slide, please, though. So now this was all good, but turned out to be problematic in uh, multi-vendor Anycast sets. Uh, RFC 7873 did not give a precise recipe for creating server cookies, with, as a consequence, that cookies created by software of one vendor could not be recognized by another vendor's name server software. Our draft is addressing precisely this and gives a precise recipe 
for creating the server cookies, catering for any cost sets that contain different vendor implementations. Next slide. So the first proof of concept implementations were done one year ago at the hackathon of ITF 104 in Prague. And it was a huge success. So implementers of the different open source DNS software vendors managed to create interoperable server cookies. So next slide. Mission accomplished. Well, almost. The draft was not working group document yet, and also the authors of RFC 7873 had worked on an update too, addressing things we did not address in our draft yet, such as directions for safely updating and rolling server cookies. So next slide, please. We merged with Donald Eastlake and Mark Andrews' efforts on updating uh, RFC 7873. We incorporated input from the DNS op list. We added a section on how to correctly and safely update and roll server cookies. So next step, implementation experience. Uh, next slide, please. So at the hackathon at the ITF 105 in Montreal, the same people that worked on it at the previous hackathon continued their work on implementing the new server cookies, taking along the updates, and now also taking note on how to create a client cookie. So for privacy reasons, client cookie was basically a hash based on the secret and the server IP address for minimal authentication of the server. And also for those privacy reasons, the client IP address so that clients cannot be tracked based on their cookie when the client IP addresses uh, change, for example, uh, due to IPv6 privacy extensions. But that turned out to be problematic because, next slide, please. On a UDP socket, which has not been used to send out a query yet, the client IP address is not easily available. There is a way to determine it for a destination, but it involves an ugly and none of the implementers wanted to do that in the critical part of the code base that's called for every outgoing query. Next slide, please. So instead, we changed the constructing a client cookie text to state that we recommend to disable DNS cookies when privacy is required. Also, uh, the spec got adopted by the working group, this ITF. So despite that it might not have been our ideal spec, we thought it was good enough for the purpose of addressing the multi-vendor NCAS sets issues with DNS cookies. So next slide, please. Mission accomplished. Next slide, please. Except then, um, there was this flaw that was brought up on the DNS op list by Philip Homburg. Uh, besides privacy, having a client cookie associated with the client IP address has a role in server cookie creation too. When a client changes its IP address regularly, such as for example in situations with multiple gateways, servers will not recognize their own cookie anymore because it's based also on the client IP address and on the client cookie, which in such, such cases, such settings uh, change frequently. So next slide, please. This was not easy to get exactly right immediately, but uh, we managed with great help from Philip Homburg to come up with a control flow which has the same effect of including the client IP address in client cookie creation without having to have access to the client IP address before the query is sent out. And this works as follows. For each newly seen server, which does not have an associated server cookie, we create a completely new random client cookie. If the server returns the server cookie, it's registered for that server together with the client IP address, which was used for the query. 
which at that point is available. Then when that server is queried again, the client will make sure the query will use the IP address that was used earlier on, for example, by binding or reusing a bound socket. And if that fails, the client IP has changed and our cookie stage should be reset for that server. A new client cookie needs to be created and so forth. So it's a bit more involved implementation wise. Uh, we have to intelligently deal with servers that do not support cookies too, for example, but this is the general gist. Uh, next slide, please. So at the hackathon of the ITF 106 last fall in Singapore, we wrote this all down precisely right and created version two of the draft with a rewritten construction and client cookie section and a new security and privacy consideration section. So we thought next step, implementation experience, probably at the next hackathon. Next slide, please. So at the, um, these are the results of the hackathon uh, at the ITF 107, which unfortunately did not happen. That said, next slide, please. I did do an implementation of the privacy-friendly client cookies in GetINS, which is a step resolver library. And it works as designed, as described in the draft. And it will be included in the 1.6.1 release, which will be done shortly in two weeks or so. Also, I've had reassurance from Wittold from IC that client IP addresses are tracked good enough for adequate implementation in BIND. Next slide, please. So where are we now? The primary purpose of this draft was to provide a precise recipe for server cookies for the different implementations. And this has successfully been done. The recipe in the draft is already in use with not DNS since version 2.9.0 and also with bind since version 9.16. And I believe it also has been backported to bind 9.11. NSD and Unbound have a proof of concept server side implementation following the recipe. And also, I think that the text in the draft on client cookie, cookie construction is sufficient for a knowing and considered client side implementation in resolvers, such as uh, the not resolver Unbound bind uh, resolver side. So, what is the next step now? So my question to you now is, next slide, <laughs> is our mission accomplished? And that's the end of the presentation. Thank you, Willem. Uh, any questions from the room? <laughs> yeah, I have my window open, uh, Stefan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, I have a question from Mark. Mark Groeneweg. Please go ahead. You uh, mentioned a uh, POC implementation for NSD. When will it be mainstream? Um, yeah, so I, I don't know. So it, that could be uh, soonish. We sort of have the principle that things uh, will be released without com extra compile option, uh, only when it's RFC, more or less. Does that answer your question? Um, not quite. Uh, you tell me you are waiting for RFC on this. <laughs> uh, not DNS and Bind are already uh, working with this. So yeah. why not release the NSD code for this? So maybe we should ask our bo my boss. <laughs> He's not present, only the yeah, chair is. He's not present. He's chairing the session here. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, good question. Uh, so heads off here. If there's an RFC, we will implement it. Yeah. 
Heads on. Uh, heads on. Uh, Mark, is your question uh, answered? Uh, yes, for now. Yeah. Uh, and any other questions from the room? Then I have a question to uh, to you, uh, Willem, and the, the authors. So the next step question mark is uh, working group last call. Yes. Okay, so um, I will invite all the uh, the room and all the people on the mailing list to read the document. And we will start uh, a working group last call. Well, Tim will schedule the working group last calls. So it will be this week, next week, the week after. So we try to do an, a call for adoption or working group last call every week. It will be scheduled soon. It will be part of the actions uh, uh, we will publish uh, after this meeting. Any other comments, remarks? No. Thank you. Thank you, Willem. The next up is uh, Tim or Tom. Yeah, I'm ready. This is Tom. Excellent. Thank you, Tom. Are your slides now up in the on WebEx? Yes. Okay, excellent. Good. Uh, yeah. So about a, I guess a year and a half ago, we released the first version of this draft, and uh, it's been four updates. Um, we've got a lot of feedback on the mailing list, but it's never been presented at a working group. Um, we were trying to get some implementation experience, and and Mark. Andrews has done some of that uh, on an older version. I'm not sure if his has been updated for this latest version. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> I'll go over the basics of it um, rather quickly. Um, it's a fairly short draft. Um, it's intended for authoritative servers. And the idea is that when you install a resource record, um, they're could be a lifetime associated with that record where it makes sense to have that rec record published. Um, the most obvious case is with an, uh, an update from a DHCP server where there's a certain lease lifetime associated with the lease of the address uh, attached to a name. Uh, but there's lots of other uses as well. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, there have been a few maybe proprietary and non-interoperable solutions, uh, but no standard solution. And so in discussion with Mark, um, I decided to write this uh, and Tim helped me um, going through a, a lot of the details. Um, it could be managed by the primary server where when the records are added, the primary server can do the timeouts of the records that they cover. Um, but there'll be a transition period where, not, um, where um, they may have to be managed externally through DNS updates. And so you can liken that to either the primary server um, using reference counting to know when records uh, exist and should be removed versus maybe garbage collection where an external manager would be um, periodically scanning see if a record should be removed um, but it does provide a transition mechanism next slide um, the information that you have of how long that the dns record should be in the database um, could be an absolute time or it could be a relative time um, there are you know, IOT devices out there that would make use of this that don't have real time clock hardware. So um, they are tend to use a relative offset and there's already an EDS zero option uh, called the update lease option that um, would give you a, uh, a relative time. And so that then the primary server could create a timeout record based on that information. Um, the uh, main thing we're trying to achieve here is not to lose that lifetime. And so if a server restarts, um, that uh, 
uh, amount of time that it received in an EDS zero option would be lost, uh, or if that a secondary has to take over for the primary, that information would be lost. So by storing this, um, the length of time that the, the records are valid, by storing that in a record itself in the database and having that synchronized across to the uh, secondaries allows for a secondary to take over and continue to um, remove that record at the, at the right time. Um, so it, it's possible that the timeout records could be included in the update in addition to the records that they cover. Um, and then the primary service would just install them. Uh, there'll be policy uh, for sure on the primary server of what could actually get um, installed in its database. So there may be, you know, restrictions on that. And uh, I think you're gonna, uh, the, for, uh, externally, you're gonna have to maybe do some testing to see what a primary service would accept and what it wouldn't accept and what conditions are based on it. And um, I think there's, you'll have to have a little bit of um, discovery there. Um, next slide. So this shows the wire format of um, what a timeout record looks like. This is the R data. Um, and there's, you know, the represented record type that the timeout covers. Um, the timeout is always going to be the same uh, owner name, class, and uh, um, I don't remember the last one. Uh, it's always going to be the uh, the same record for the same record that it represents. Um, the count will show how many. Um, hashes like each each record that it, it represents is represented by a hash um, and the count will show the number of hashes that are in the list um, the method will show um, what is the algorithm used for the hash and the expiry time shows when to remove the record itself um, if there are um, if there are um, If all of the records that the timeout represent have the same expiry time, um, then there's um, no reason to specify hashes for all of them. You can just say um, um, no, no uh, method, and then all the records that match will expire at that time. And so it's a sh kind of a shortcut where you don't really need to do any hash, hash calculations. It's only when you have multiple matching records with different expiry times uh, that you need to specify the hash for the ones that match that expiry time. Um, the nice thing about using a hash is that it um, it's a hash of the R data of the represented record. And it doesn't matter what the length of the R data is, it will always be a fixed length um, in, in the timeout record. Next slide. Okay, so uh, here's a simple example where uh, an update is sent with an A record, a quad A, uh, quad a record, and then other updates sent with the pointer records. Um, The, they'll have a certain amount of lease lifetime, and in this case, it's going to be uh, LN um, and the time at which the uh, update was sent is TN. So, you know, in the future, it'll expire at this absolute time of TN plus LN. Um, in this case, both the um, A and quad A records are going to expire at the same time so you don't have to specify a hash so the count is zero uh, the count is the number of hashes count is zero and the method is zero 
which is that there's no no reason to specify hashes. Um, and this is going to be the normal case where um, there's not going to be overlap between the, um, the owner name and and the type and the class. So you're going to always almost always have no uh, method zero and no hash. Um, next slide. There, um, there are a few cases where there will be um, different times, different expiry times with the same owner name, um, record type and hash, I mean, and record type and class. Um, and a common example may be in the service discovery uh, realm where you're sending uh, unicast updates for like wide area bonjour or a service like that. Um, you'll have PTR records that point to the different um, instances of the service. So the R data is different, but the owner name, class, and type is the same. Uh, and they'll be coming from different hosts, which means they'll be coming at different times. So the expiry times will be different. Um, so in this case, you have um, the PTR record and the, from the two different hosts looks identical. And so in the primary server's database, you're going to have to create uh, hash entries to have the different timeouts for um, host A or printer A versus printer B. Um, and so the the, on the bottom, you'll see the list of timeout records that you would have, and most of them are still uh, have a method of zero and no hashes, but only the PTR records have hashes because of uh, the collision there in the owner name type in class. Um, so that's about how it works. Um, we, um, we've had gone back and forth a lot with on the mailing list and made a lot of changes over time to answer all of the um, questions that we got and made some changes to um, make it work better with existing implementations, um, like including the type, um, the record type. So we're now feel like we're ready for to adopt this as a working group document and so we would like to get um, people to review it again and um, I'd like to move it forward. Thank you, Tom, indeed. So uh, please speak up now if you want to support the document, have interest. Um, we want to issue a call for adoption later. Uh, again, Tim will schedule that in the next weeks. Um, I see Joe, Joe Emily on the, on the mic. Please, Joe, go ahead. I, just, I, had, I had two uh, two things to say. One of them was, um, I, I think another reason for using an RR type for this and not something more ephemeral like an EDNS zero option or something is that it gives people clients on the outside who are not involved in publishing the zone the ability to see what's going on. You can troubleshoot. So if you want to di diagnose a problem where a record has disappeared from one place but not from another place or something, you might look for a timeout record and that might give you some clues. And if this information was hidden in, say, the update protocol or um, it's like in a, in a pseudo RR that disappears and is not published, then you don't have that diagnostic information. So I think actually I spent a lot of time thinking that this proposal looks really quite ugly, but I've, I've changed my mind. I think it's better. <laughs> so that seems good. Um, so that was just a suggestion. And the I don't know whether it needs to be in the draft or not. I just thought I'd mention it. The, the other observation I had, though, and maybe this is something for to think about after adoption, is that I wonder whether this protocol would be simpler if it was just defined only to deal with RR sets, get rid of the whole hash business, unless, you know, I hope maybe it's possible to do that and not eliminate any really, really important use cases, because the protocol is much, much simpler and easier to understand and probably easier to implement if it just works on the unit of an RR set and you just ignore, you just don't accommodate the problem of having different timeouts for different RRs in a single RR set. 
I think that would make it a lot simpler. And maybe I'm, I, I don't personally see the use cases in, in my life that would make the hash necessary. So I'm just, I'm curious as, as to whether my experience is, is not global. I see Mark's about to explain this to me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next uh, in the queue is uh, Mark, Mark Andrews. Um, there's definitely cases where you where you need the need the hash. Um, it doesn't really make much difference internally in terms of the what the server needs to support. It just it's just the regeneration of uh, timeout records as you uh, remove a hash, and that's a relatively straightforward thing to do. It's just remove remove the remove the record. Um, I can't remember whether the current one has multiple timeouts in there or not. Earlier ones did. Um, but yeah, plus the Von Jor is a is the perfect example of why you need multiple timeouts and not and you're not dealing with an RO set. And internally, well, um, it's easy enough to track track everything and computing. Spinning a hash is relatively cheap, so you only need to compute the hash when your timeout record actually comes up for expiry. So um, you don't need to maintain it and things like that. You don't need to maintain maintain state about the hashes. Okay, thank you. You. Um, I see another question from Jim. Jim Reed, please go ahead. Thanks, Ben. Quick question. If we're going to be using hashes, will there be a need for some kind of provision for signaling which hash algorithm is used? Supposing at some point SHA 256 is deprecated. Yeah, um, so we don't want to have uh, a lot of different people, a lot of different implementations trying to figure out which hashes other implementations support. So, uh, the preference is to define a single hash that everyone uses, and that um, if the condition occurs in the future where that hash is found to have vulnerabilities, and we'll define a new one. Uh, there's a registry established in the draft to do this, and um, then that one will be the one that everyone should switch to. There'll still be some older implementations maybe with the other one. So you'll have to continue to support it if you, um, if you want to be interoperable, but, uh, there's no reason to define multiple types of hashes at this point. Though we have the mechanism to do so. So I wasn't saying defining the hash algorithms, but there must be somewhere we need to know if there's a possibility in the future that the hash algorithm has to change for whatever reason that clients can tell this stuff was signed or used the old hash algorithm, this one's using the new one. Yeah, and so that's what the method is uh, identifier is for. And me method one means SHA-256. Uh, the first, I'm sorry, method one means the first 128 bits of SHA-256. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Tom. Okay, so method two would be shaft three eight five or whatever. Yeah, or shake. Uh, I initially tried to use shake and um, got some pushback there, but um, thanks. Yep. Um, at some point, we might need to define a new um, error code um, to say that say that this is no longer supported or something like that um, against the update. But yeah, I don't think it's going to be a real big issue. Um, I can't remember my crypto enough to know which which things, which property has got to be, which property has got to fail for the timeout not records not work. But I don't think it's going to end up being a real big problem anyway because we've you've got the data there. You've got to try and it's it's only matching. It's only matching the data within itself. So I think we could get away with, apart from the fact that people don't want to use MP5 or even 
whatever it was before that. Um, so it's in terms of rolling it, we, we're only going to roll it. It's only going to be rolled because the algorithm's gone out of the name server itself. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Tom. Uh, well, there's a good interaction with uh, also with the software developers previously, I understand. So uh, thank you for the input from the working group. Um, we will issue a call for adoption in one or two weeks. That's up to the planning from, uh, from Tim. Um, I want to wrap up this presentation and go to the next presentation. I think Schumann will give will present. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So can you can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, excellent. I'll show your slides. Open up your slides. There we are. Do you okay. see the slides? So, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So this is a draft that was put out recently by uh, Paul Vixi. Ralph Dolmans and myself, and that has had a bit of discussion on the NSOP list already. So I'll go through these slides uh, quickly, but Paul and Ralph, I think, are both here. So uh, I trust that they'll interject comments uh, as needed. So next slide. I'll start with the uh, motivation. Basically, uh, as I think most people know, there is a range of behavior in DNS resolvers today in how they uh, process delegations. So some prefer the parent and a set some the child and for many others the behavior uh, varies depending on the um, uh, dynamic state and content of queries and responses that they process so some of our uh, goals in this draft are to uh, try to get more commonality and predictability in the behavior and to do so in a way that is in accordance with the dns protocol and also to solve a set of operational problems that frequently come up the main uh, recommendations in the draft are that the resolvers should deterministically obtain the child NSRR set during iteration and place that preferentially in the cache over the parent NS set. And number two, to revalidate the delegation of the parent at the expiration of the TTL of the parent uh, NS set. So can we move to the next slide, please? All right, so it is clearly stated in the DNS protocol specifications that the child NSRR set is the authoritative one, and that the corresponding parent NS set is essentially non authoritative glue. The uh, data ranking rules in RFC 2181 further clarify how resolvers should categorize and treat data of various types and Authoritative data should clearly be preferred. I've just excerpted in the slide some of the relevant rules here, but I'm not going to read them all now. Uh, but additionally, the child NS set uh, can be signed with the NSSEC and the parent cannot. And the NSSEC, as you may all know, only signs authoritative data. And the data ranking rules also, as you might suspect, state authenticated data is to be preferred. Um, in case anyone thinks these are general rules and maybe the NS set is special and could be excluded for them, uh, I don't think that's true either. I neglected to put it on the slide, but I think 2181 at some point says something along the lines that um, NS records corresponding to a zone cut are the property of the child zone. So this is not happenstance or oversight, but clearly intentional. Uh, next slide, please. So how does the resolver get the child NS set? The DNS protocol, after all, does not require resolvers to explicitly fetch it. So they usually see it when authoritative responses coming from a child zone include the NSRR set in the authority section of their DNS response. And then data ranking rules dictate that this should be then placed preferentially in the cache. Uh, so the behavior of adding the NS set used to be almost universal but authority servers are not technically required to do this. And the trend these days is towards minimizing unnecessary data in responses. So, for example, very popular DNS implementations these days are now defaulting to this so called minimal responses configuration. So, with <coughs> minimal responses, the resolver wouldn't see the child NS set at all. 
unless some downstream client of the resolver issues an NS query. And this is not something that normal end user applications do as far as I know. So we can't rely on it to occur with any regularity. So uh, we think we need a systematic way to observe the child NS again. And the draft recommends that when following referral responses, resolvers should issue an explicit parallel query for the NS record at the child stage. Uh, next slide, please, Daniel. So in theory, the parent and child NS set content should match, right? So unless people have misconfigured things. So who, who really cares what resolvers prefer anyway? The main reason I wanted to point out that you might care is that although the contents should match, the TTL often does not. If the child zone is authoritative, they can dictate the TTL that resolvers should actually honor. And this allows them to more rapidly make changes to their name server configurations when needed by temporarily deploying a short TTL so that they can not only more quickly make those changes visible, but also more quickly back out those changes if things go wrong. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so Ralph with his implementers hat, I wanted to make sure I mentioned this note. The NS query need not bottleneck the fast path. It can be sent in parallel and be processed opportunistically and does not need to delay resolution of the query that actually triggered the referral processor. And I'm just gonna quote Ralph uh, verbatim here. He says, uh, not much risk, little complexity, and no speed difference. The opportunistic nature of this query also allows resolvers to deal with the small subset of broken authority servers that don't respond to explicit NS queries without incurring any performance penalty. Next slide, please. All right, so now moving on to the second part of the draft, which is delegation revalidation. We state the resolvers need to recheck the parent delegation at the expiration of the TTL of the parent NS set at the very latest. So this prevents an important security issue arising, namely, a child zone living beyond their authorized lifetime. If, for example, the parent has uh, removed the delegation or redelegated the zone to another party. So without revalidation, this situation could, could arise if, for example, the child zone operator maliciously set a very long TTL in attempt to uh, artificially prolong its life and resolve her caches. Uh, it could be done by accident, I suppose, also, or because resolvers that do prefetching of DNS records, which is becoming more common, continue to inadvertently prolong the life of the child. So this, by the way, is not a theoretical problem, but one has that, one that has been observed in the field. There are a number of research papers going back a few years that talk about this topic. You can search for ghost domains if you like to locate them. Uh, next slide. So how should we implement revalidation? The simple and probably most obvious scheme is to just cap the NSTTL in your cache to the lower of the parent and the child NSTTL. Uh, but this draft also presents a uh, more detailed algorithm that deals more effectively with some more involved corner case configurations. And uh, the last bullet item on this page is uh, not in the draft uh, yet, but it came up in mailing list discussion. Uh, Brian Dixon, if I recall, suggested it, and it was backed by others, that if all child servers are assessed to be lame or unusable, that should automatically trigger a revalidation action at the parent zone. Uh, so we agree, but uh, it would have to be done in conjunction with a hold down timer of some sort to avoid inflicting unintentional DOS on the parent zone. Next slide, please. Uh, so I just want to mention these ideas are not new, of course, by any stretch. Uh, Paul and others wrote them up in the uh, res improved draft of 2010, which I think many people are aware of. Wilder Weingard's also proposed something like this in his resolver mitigations draft from 2009. And uh, the unbound resolver from NLNet Labs roughly implements this today with a configuration knob called uh, hardened referral path. Next slide. And uh, this is the last slide. So discussion around this draft has predictably caused a 
related discussion about whether we need to like totally overhaul and redesign the DLN, DNS delegation mechanism. Uh, we are not attempting to do so here. This draft is proposing a minimal set of changes. It improves things, it doesn't require any wire protocol changes and can be done unilaterally by changes on the resolvers. Uh, that said, there are undoubtedly deficiencies in the zone delegation mechanism that could be addressed with the redesign. Uh, I'm personally interested in that subject, but that could be the subject of a much more ambitious effort, and it isn't clear whether it could be successful given how entrenched uh, the current DNS is. So I'm just going to stop there, but before I turn it over for discussion, I just wanted to quickly check with Paul and Ralph to see if there was anything I missed or misstated. I think you had it all, Shimon. Okay, thank you, Ralph. I have since realized that uh, if the authority server is not doing minimal responses, then we can treat its additional data as adequate and we don't need a second query. But that's an optimization. Uh, what you presented is all true and correct. Thank you. I think we're ready for uh, questions and discussion. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Shimon. Um, first in line is uh, Warren, Warren Kumari. So, Warren Kumari for the record. Um, so, slide nine actually answered much of my question, but um, there was a lot of other stuff in Res Improve as well. And I just wanted to say that a lot of that was also useful. And so, I hope that um, you know, Res Improve can also move forward. At some point. Uh, yeah, so I think if this draft uh, actually moves forward, Warren, we have covered everything that was in the re original Res Improve draft. The main additional item in Res Improve was uh, what's called uh, clarifying uh, what NX domain means, and that and that has already been republished as RFC eighty twenty, if you recall. Awesome. When? Um, next question in line is uh, Stefan. Ah, uh, regarding the issue of uh, explicit uh, NS queries, just want to remind that we are also discussing draft uh, RFC 7816 BIS minimization. On one of the big change in the draft uh, with regard to the old RFC is to about explicit NS queries because in RFC 7816, a QNIM minimizing resolver used the NS queries. And now there is a change to, pre, uh, to prefer A queries because one of the reasons being that um, some, many, don't know, uh, authoritative resolvers time out on explicit NS queries. So um, both um, drafts are related in that way. Yeah, yeah. that's a very good point. Uh, Sorry, Sorry, there's echo here, here from someone. someone. I'm, going, I'm going, to going to ask Ralph to comment on that because he uh, has some opinions. But we are aware of that, and this is one of the reasons why the query is opportunistic in nature. But Ralph, do you want to chime in? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I'm involved in both drafts, actually. Um, so the difference indeed here is that this one is opportunistically. So if the NS query fills here, it is all fine. And also, if we would do QNAM minimization with the NSQ type, then there are still cases where you um, won't send the NSQ type to the APEX because if you are going to resolve a name that's um, where the, the original QNAM is the same as the name for the APEX, you know there's no delegation there. You already sent with the incoming uh, Q type. So even if we would do QNAM minimization with the NSQ type, it would not uh, cover all. That answered the question. Thank you. Um, last question by uh, Jim. Everybody still around? Yeah, I forget. Uh, Jim is me, Daniel. So it's oh, Daniel Migo. Oh, Jim, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, Daniel. Keep going. So, so um, yeah, so I, I like this kind of work. Um, it's something we 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 touched a little bit in uh, in our recommendation for DNS validator um, 
So uh, I support this kind of work. Uh, the question I would have is um, why do you uh, consider uh, to cap the, the NSTTL based on the NS of the parents and maybe not the DS record? Yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, I, I guess we could uh, cap it based on the DS if uh, it were the case that DNSSEC was were ubiquitously deployed. Okay. Since it isn't, we can't really rely on it to cover uh, the uh, revalidation case that we need to happen across the board. Uh, in, uh, in theory, at least, the DS record, if it is present, is supposed to, by the DNS protocol specification, have the same TTL as the delegating NS set, uh, but as a practical uh, zones are not signed and we do have to deal with it, we can't rely on DS. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Yep. This is Paul, I'd like to follow up. <clears throat> There's no reason in principle why the TTL of the DS record cannot be part of the equation of choosing the revalidation interval because if it is expiring differently and sooner than the parent ns then uh, there's no problem with uh, revalidating it when it expires however that is what a dnssec validator will do so we did not feel a need to mention it Uh, sorry, it was a little bit abrupt end of Paul. Is still, Paul, are you still on? I'm sorry, that, that, that concludes my remarks. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah we, maybe it's on my side. I have some uh, network uh, problems. Thank you. Um, concluding, uh, so there has been some discussion on the mailing list. I, we, uh, the, the chairs also follow the discussion on DNS operations mailing list, so on, on the OWERC list. Uh, I so, I think from the room, there were questions, and I think it's positive. Um, I'd like to see a little bit more discussion on the mailing list. I, to be fair, I haven't read up the last emails on the DNS op, our own ITF DNS op mailing list. Um, but. Uh, we will issue a call for adoption later. I, I, I don't want, I don't know when to schedule that, but before the next ITF, virtual ITF. Um, but I, I, I'd like to see a little bit more discussion also on the mailing list. I think the draft is quite new. How many people, uh, Schumann, uh, Paul, and uh, Ralph, has, uh, you already have seen a lot of in, uh, comments, feedback on so the document. I think we've seen a fair number of comments. I guess you'll have to judge how, how much discussion you want to see happen before uh, calling for any specific action. But there's been discussion not only on the um, DNS op list, but also on the OARC DNS operations list. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, and I think it's continuing to happen. So, if you feel like uh, we should continue that until we get additional comments from a larger set of folks, I think that's fine with us. Yeah. Let's, uh, okay. Okay. yeah, yeah. I don't want to put a time uh, frame on it, but uh, let's, the chairs will look at the, the ongoing discussion and then kick off uh, a call for adoption. Yeah, I think there, this is Suzanne. I, I, I think um, I can, we can see this. Be good to see the uh, zero one, and um, see where discussion goes. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Sorry, sorry, Mark. I closed uh, the the queue after Paul Paul Vixi. If it's common, the bind or already implements the timeouts, time adding. And it's been doing for over a decade. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for all your input and feedback. Um, then I want to go to the last uh, presentation by Dimitri. Took me one minute to bring the slides up. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, excellent. 
Okay, now I'm waiting for slides. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, my uh, uh, draft uh, introduces uh, the uh, Russian ghost profile uh, for the NSEC. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, Russian ghost algorithms were introduced uh, into the uh, DNSSEC uh, in 2010 in RFC 5933. Uh, this uh, RFC uh, specified using of the algorithms uh, GHOST uh, R3410 uh, 2001 for digital signature, GHOST R3411-94 uh, for message digest for uh, DS record. But uh, unfortunately, both uh, of these algorithms are, de are deprecated uh, in Russia since 2019. Next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, as uh, we in Russia have an interest in uh, reintroducing uh, GHOST to DNSSEC, uh, here is uh, the new draft. Uh, 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 here is the link to the implementation of uh, the uh, profile of the suggest profile. The new profile uh, prescribes using uh, new ghost uh, digital signature algorithms uh, described in RFC uh, 7091. Uh, with uh, digital signature parameters introduced in RFC 7836 uh, and uh, message digest uh, described in uh, RFC 6986. Uh, next slide, please. So this uh, document uh, was designed to update RFC 5933. Uh, but uh, as it uh, pr provides additions to, to IN registries, uh, there is no problems uh, with uh, DNS uh, security algorithm numbers registry. Its policy uh, implies RFC required. But uh, as uh, adding new DS uh, type digest algorithm requires some detection, uh, it means that uh, the document doesn't fit independence uh, stream requirements. So in these circumstances, uh, I uh, have to ask uh, the working group to adopt it as a working group document. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, that uh, it will be done. Many thanks. That's all for the that's all for the presentations. Uh, so ask any questions. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dimitri. Um, I see one question from Stanislav. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, hello, uh, everybody. Uh, in fact, I would like to support this war because I think that it is in favor of crypto agility of the DNSSEC. So I support this and I hope that it can be used uh, at least inside Russia. Thank you, Dmitry. Thank you. Okay. Another uh, question here from Valery. Please go ahead. Uh, I also support uh, this work um, because uh, the algorithm, previous ghost algorithm, had some weaknesses and they definitely need to be changed and uh, there is no no way to do it other than a uh, standard process. So either um, the draft should be adopted or authors should seek for uh, AD sponsorship but I think that uh, since the NSA group is uh, long concluded, uh, probably this working group is maybe a home for this draft. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, Jim, Jim Reeds, next in queue. Thanks, Neil. Just a very quick question. I support this work. I think it needs to be done. 
um, but just also make sure that those references to the earlier now deprecated crypto algorithms and RSCs for DOS, DNS, XMA, we should make sure those get marked as being deprecated or obsoleted or something like that. I haven't been, I haven't been uh, too quick in actually going to check that information in the ANA registry, but I'm just making that point here now. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Good remark. Um, the last person in queue is Warren. Thanks, Warren. Kamari as a he. So, yeah, I was originally asked if I could AD sponsor this, and I felt that it was much better if it went through DNS up. Um, you know, we have a group which just fits well in, and so I think it should be discussed here. But a reminder that our main thing to do is figure out if this works correctly with DNS up. Um, not discussions on the algorithm, you know, the cost algorithm itself. So hopefully this can go through there and can go, go relatively quickly. Okay, thank you. So given the first comments on the, in the room, and uh, Suzanne, please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think we will schedule this draft for a call for adoption somewhere later after the, after the meeting. Um, and please, uh, ongoing discussions on the mailing list are more than welcome. Feedback, comments. Any other questions, remarks on this draft? No. Uh, Time-wise, we're running a little bit out, so I already warned everybody we would run into 16 or 4 o'clock in 15 minutes. UTC, it's now 4 o'clock 20 minutes. Um, before I want to close the session, I want to give the opportunity to people to ask a more generic, general question, not related to the drafts. Any comments, questions, points for improvement? Oh, I shouldn't ask that. Okay, good. So, uh, summarizing, uh, we have a number of um, call for adoptions that will be scheduled for the draft uh, Ayana Young um, we are close to a working group uh, last call but we want to make sure that the Ayana process will work um, so that's the first step and then we will go for the second step and that will be a working group last call the DNS op will go to working the last call um let's help me out that was the time out we're also going for the call for adoption will be scheduled um the sorry the re-evaluation revalidation ns will also be after some discussion go for call for adoption and the very last presentation on ghost uh, signature algorithms will also be scheduled for call for adoption later this this month. Um, if I miss some action points, you probably will uh, uh, see that in an email sent out by one of the chairs. Um, I want to wrap up the session. I want to ask everyone, if not done yet, uh, sign the blue sheets on the etherpad. This is your very last moment, opportunity to say something. If I forgot something to mention. No? One, going one, going twice. Well, I want to thank you for your time and for your input and for the, I think, very productive meeting. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. <clears throat> I will stop the recording now.